A very warm welcome to IMPACT 2020. We are very excited to meet you coming from so different time zones, from territories on the planet. So I have to say you good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Wherever you are, we are very lucky to have you with us. We are especially welcoming the participants of IMPACT, who are we are missing in presence, but we already met and are with us online in the next days. And for sure, our distinguished guests and speakers and beings today and tomorrow who will be here with us. A major thanks to our amazing technical team. And firstly, Juliane Beck, Anne Charlotte Günzel, and Julia Spunting, who over the last days transformed and reorganize that space here and form it into a hybrid stage studio due to the known circumstances. Yesterday, a small bird caused a major delay. And I see it got lost here in this stage area. And the only way out was to turn off the lights and open the doors and wait. We wait so long as he could find its way out back into the real world. Thinking about entirely new alliances is not only demanded by the time in which we are organizing this symposium. When, we, when the impact of COVID-19 pandemic is affecting drastically all spheres of our existence in the world. It is not only here in the place we are talking about, the Zollverein coal mine industrial complex, you already seen some pictures of it, a monument standing for the industrial exploitation of natural resources with its devastating ecological, social, economical and infrastructural consequences. New alliances are more than ever essential for approaching the challenges of the 21st century. New forms of collaboration and co cooperation, the inter uh, uh, interactive interference of many bodies, rethinking planetary kinship, including non-human entities. And that's what we are going to talk in the next days about. We need to bring together multiple perspectives, the imagination, practices of affirmation, diverse research modes and proposals. We need other models of thinking and acting in and listening to explicitly multiple fields of knowledge. Since the foundation of PACT, we are thankful to offering explore spaces here in that place, a former shower house, for mutual learning to engage in transdisciplinary and transversal practices and thinking. It is encouraging and empowering to experience, and that's what we have read in the last weeks from proposals from all over the world, how many people are working 
connecting to these issues in the world, at least even the impact participants. Following this vision, impact is a think tank and a pool, and that's very important, of practices. Being part of impact means joining a common space, engaging in vibrant encounters, listen and engage in different knowledge fields beyond and between disciplines. Since its first edition in 2004, IMPACT has included ecological, digital and post-colonial issues as well as activist practices, digital transaction and interaction spaces, so a broad main and field of interest, artistic research and various processes and forms of collaboration. Especially in these times, I feel the extreme necessity of encounters like this, where we move beyond disciplines to seek resonances, as well as new social, social ties, communities, friendship, trust and common values on a global scale. We are starting tonight with Professor Rosi Bradotti, one of the most influential thinker and for me, groundbreaking in her future perspectives, joining from us here from Utrecht and Protectorama Toxica, who will appear here in the space later on. We are also very happy to receive questions and comments online, which we are going to pose after the lecture to Rosi and to Johannes Paul Retter. Now, it's a pleasure of Anne-Charlotte Günzel, who is the head of communication at PACT, to introduce you to Professor Rosi Bredotti, who is going to join us very soon online from Utrecht. Thank you. So, um, as, being, as it's been said, I have the pleasure of introducing Rosi Bredotti to you, an outstanding thinker and a pioneer of post-humanism and feminist theory. Professor Bradotti is a seminal figure in contemporary philosophy. She graduated from the Sorbonne in Paris, Paris and became the founding director of the Women's Studies program in Utrecht, where she is also a distinguished university professor and the founding director of the Center for Humanities. You might have come across her writing. Um, her main publications include Nomadic Subjects and Nomadic Theory, both uh, published in 2011 and the post-human um, from 2013, as well as post-human knowledge from 2019. Rosi Bredotti, from a feminist perspective, reconfigures embodiment and sexual difference through their relations to technology, historic events and popular culture. She shows how feminist philosophy builds on the embodied and embedded brands of materialism that were pioneered in the last century by writers like Simone de Beauvoir, who famously said that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman, hereby revealing the power relations that are already embedded in the definition or the notion of the human, and I'm stressing the man in human here. Bredotti argues that the notion of the human, as coined in humanism, is far from a neutral term. Because now, today, as we are witnessing that the boundaries between the human and its others are becoming increasingly blurred through our digital lives as well as through reproductive technologies and other forms of biotechnology, which we will also come across tomorrow with the talk by Las Blanc, um, these question um, what it actually means, um, no, this question what it, um, leads to the human um, as a notion taking a new turn. Um, but where does this new post-human condition leave us? Who or what is the post-human subject? You and we all uh, will learn more in Rosi Bredotti's talk tonight. And now we're happy to welcome Rosi, who is with us via Zoom. And hi! <laughs> Hi, and right next to us as well. Um, we're most honored and pleased to have you here. Um, and we're already looking forward to receiving your questions to this lecture. Rosi, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, dear Angela, Stefan, and everybody. It's all great. What an incredible organization. And now all everybody out there online. And how wonderful it is to me.
Kommt schon mal hier hin. Ja. Soll ich sagen, dass wir Sie nicht hören? Okay. Rosi, we seem to have a technical issue here. We can't hear you that well. So um, we're trying to figure that out. And in the meantime, um, I'm sorry for everyone watching. You have to stay with us for a moment. Yeah, yeah, you have to stay with us for a moment. Uh, maybe we could introduce uh, to tomorrow uh, the program starting at six o'clock again. And we are welcoming, firstly, Lars Blank, who's uh, working at the uh, um, Technical University of Aachen, uh, one of the most prestigious technical universities in Germany, a biotechnologist. And he's uh, bringing us, I think, uh, new perspectives on the relation between biotechnology and uh, ecology. Yes, he will be speaking about microbes. Um, and their role in maybe also tackling issues um, that we all experience at the moment, the ecological disaster. And um, I think it's quite interesting because you wouldn't expect that microbes could play a role in that, but he will elaborate on that. So it's, uh, maybe this is just because we have time. <laughs> I've been in his lab and uh, actually you can't see nothing. And it's all about different and very strange experimental setups, uh, which are mostly liquids. And it's super interesting to listen tomorrow to him, what really he is working on. And these are, some of them are kind of, really kind of ground breaking inventions and hopefully even something which is helping the planet to survive. I think this approach is very much also linked to impact in general because we're bringing together people from science, from contemporary art and also philosophy. So maybe we can also introduce the concept of impact a bit because I don't think we've spoken about that earlier. Exactly. That's a bit the DNA, that there are very diverse positions and they're contrasting each other. And mostly this is something which is uh, generating connections which are rarely to find normally because mostly uh, research is based on very circular and bubble research. And to bring these people together, I think the space is very talented for. Yes, I mean, we had uh, forensic architecture, for example, in the past where like almost paradigmatic for connecting different forms of research and I mean, what, how I understand the format, it tries to engage that discourse between disciplines and to also form new ways of collaborating and to get together. And I mean, it's quite different now. And I mean, we're seeing <laughs> there are many difficulties that might be unexpected, but um, yeah. And, and it's very interesting if you have these very diverse positions that they're going to connect during the time you are together which is now very difficult to, to actually to proceed and to find a way how we are encountering online, which is so much determined on very specific statements. So how to hang up around and have fun together in order to connect these uh, very diverse positions. That's something where we, which we have to explore deeply in the next years, probably. <laughs> Uh, let's hope that there will be a way maybe before <laughs> to get back together. But um, yeah, maybe I'm just looking at our um, <laughs> our team. Okay, so it's a bit slapstick, right? Because <laughs> we tried it before, <laughs> we and everything even... worked fine. And uh, okay. Oh, Rosie, Rosie. we're back. It's such a relief to see you again. Oh, I, I hear you. Never tell a machine that you're in a highway. <laughs> Never tell a machine you have an audience that is speaking on it. The machine will throw a tantrum, it's obvious. Is the audio fine? Do you perfect. want me just to do a podcast and not do the image? No, it sounds perfect now. It sounds perfect, lovely. So let me start again by thanking you, Angela, Stefan, the technical team, and everybody who's giving us the time to come together to do some thinking thinking the most uh, ne necessary, vital, aesthetic, erotic, and difficult of activities. <laughs> thinking like breathing is what we do, even when you can't breathe for a number of reasons. And trying to think together through the difficulties of the times that we're going through 
is what this wonderful team of people as Oferai are trying to do. Amazing. And thinking as opposed to pontificating, critical creative thinking, thinking as a way of coping with the times, to be worthy of the times. And the posthuman convergence, another post, we don't really need any more of those, we need a better term. But the posthuman convergence, which I will try to talk a little bit around tonight, is really at the core of so many of our problems. I was very touched by how Stefan started by reminding us of the pandemic, the big pandemic that we are laboring under. Now think for a moment of COVID-19. This is a man mind, a human made virus. Uh, created by environmental devastation, by violent human-animal interaction, taking off in the global economy with, with uh, intercontinental travel and transportation and all sorts of contaminations. An environmental problem uh, due to human interference that becomes a social problem insofar as this pandemic has revealed the depth and the extremes of inequalities, of social economic injustices in terms of access to sanitation, to basic necessities, to healthcare, and very soon the new global war for vaccines, which is just starting. Uh, COVID that becomes a social problem had been, been born as an environmental one. And what is the answer to this pandemic? How are we surviving? Look at us tonight through more technology, through digital interconnection, using the very tools of cognitive capitalism, although we know that cognitive capitalism is at the source of the very problems that we are addressing. Welcome to the posthuman convergence where advanced technologies and environmental degradation run together, where enormous disparities in health and wealth and access go together with enormous enthusiasm about the great technological advances, the great levels of development that are being reached, pulled in very opposite directions at the same time. And this is what I call the posthuman convergence, a convergence between the ideas of humanism with the human is at the core of everything, man as the me measure of all things, and then man in inverted commas of implies ethnocentric, gender specific um, uh, qualities. And um, it's supposed to be a universal feature, but it is so culture specific. Look at the image that encapsulates classical European humanism, the Vitruvian man that I talk so much about in my, in my books, gorgeous Vitruvius, um, a masculine, perfect body, drop dead gorgeous, um, completely uh, white and about his sexuality, Freud wrote quite a few interesting things in his famous article on Da Vinci's Vitruvius, go and look it up. How universal is this? It is a very, parochial, patriarchal, colonial, Eurocentric vision of what the universal is, of what the human is. And it's supposed to represent all humans, but it sure does not. And before you dismiss this Renaissance classical ideal as something passé, you will say, ah, who believes in that? I want to remind you that the Vitruvian man has been adopted by NASA as the emblem for their uh, exploration of outer space. And that image is the badge that is worn by all our astronauts um, in their interstellar trips. That image is sewed on the flag that is already flying on the moon. It has already gone beyond this planetary um, dimension. Um, it is here to stay. So looking again, and what we mean by human when we say we humans are in this pandemic together. We humans are in this technological universe together. We may well be in this together, but we sure are not one and the same. So we need to think the, the interconnection of the different levels of our humanness, of our being human, but also the enormous differences that, that separate us. Um, uh, and I think um, those differences take the form of a critique of this civilizational model, um, this, this man of reason, uh, that is so standardized, and yet this man of reason defines himself as much 
by what he excludes as by what it includes in his understanding of what it means to be human. And this he is, of course, put in inverted commas, but this is a masculinist ideals that excludes women, LBGT people, all kinds of others. And uh, there is a process of othering built into the creation of this um, universal humanist ideal. And the sexualized and racialized others are those that fall out of the understanding of the human. They are human, yes, but of a second class, of a second degree. Now we'll come back to the critiques of humanism later on in some more details. But that is the first pole of the posthuman critique. We need to look at what it is that we say when we say we're in this together, we are all humans. Well, are we really? We may all be humans, uh, but some are sure more mortal than others. So how do we do, how do we deal with this necessity to find binding elements without flattening out the power differences between us? All of this is already complicated enough. Imagine when we come to the second pole of the, of the um, post-human convergence, the critique of anthropocentrism. What happens if we were to also made to acknowledge that all humans actually share a sense of exceptionalism and a speciesism, as the environmental activists call it, and a sense that our species is really exceptional and special, that we have the right to exploit and access all other bodies of other species, and that we can treat nature as an endless supply of resources, accessible, usable, exploitable, and that we reduce the entire section of humans to the status of subhumans and infrahumans, not quite humans. Anthropos is quite a, a regime of power. Now, environmentalists have been doing critiques of anthropocentrism for um, a long, long time, and they have taught us that there is an anthropocentric bias in everything that we do, even in critical theory, um, that there is always a, somewhere along the line about the suffering of humans, of humanoids. <laughs> uh, and it is much more difficult to think about the suffering of all other entities and at the moment of the planet as a whole. And the scale of the problems is what makes it very difficult to think the scale of the devastation of other species, the scale of the environmental um, devastation, the scale of the human losses uh, in terms of the COVID epidemic, the scale of the loss of animal lives in the bushfires in California and Australia, the scale makes thinking a very painful exercise. And I think thinking in a multi-scalar manner is one of the issues that is required of us at the moment. But thinking beyond our species is a little bit counterintuitive. It is not something that we are taught to do easily. Um, it doesn't come normal. It doesn't come as easily as to say, oh, I am against capitalism. Oh, I am against patriarchy. Oh, I am against heteronormativity. Oh, I am against uh, fossil fuel. Stand in front of the mirror and dare to say, I'm against the human species. Um, you may do it on a day uh, you're having a bad day or you're a bit down, but it's not part of the repertoire of critique. Um, uh, and it shouldn't be, because thinking beyond anthropocentrism is not thinking against the human. It's thinking a little bit beyond the parameters of our own egotism. Um, we should also keep in mind that this sense of species supremacy, the idea that humans are somehow exceptional, is part of the nature culture mind-body divide that is so crucial to Western thinking, to Western culture, Western philosophies. And most cultures on earth do not think in such dichotomous and oppositional ways. Indigenous epistemologies, decolonial thinking, black philosophies are teaching us a lot about the human animal continuum, the nature culture continuum, the interconnections among species and dimensions. It is something that my philosopher teachers would call holism dismissively, or even worse, horror, animism, to believe that everything that lives um, is actually 
logistically and ontologically alive. Um, we are not encouraged to think um, in terms of continuums like that. And yet the ecological devastation of today is a result um, of the uh, abuses of settler colonialism, of the looting of resources through European imperialisms. Um, we can think back to the role of epidemics in colonial conquests. South America would be an example, but Australia also. We can, can think of in terms of continuing forms of environmental racism. We could think along those lines, but we don't automatically do so. And I think one of the punchlines of the posthuman convergence is to encourage us to go and move in that direction. Directions. Um, another way to describe this convergence is in more sociological terms. So we are caught between the fourth industrial revolution with its advanced technologies, genetics, informatics, neurosciences, nanotechnologies, and the sixth great extinction, also known as the Anthropocene, between two totally opposed um, uh, tendency. And it is not as if we have the fourth industrial revolution on Tuesday and the sixth great extinction on Wednesday afternoon. They are happening at the same time, concurrently. And the reason why I want to stress the convergence of the two is that I don't want them to fall apart. I want us to be able to do the impossible, which is to think conflicting ideas at the same time, make our mind work a little bit over time and think one thing and the opposite at the same time. And again, this is not what they teach you uh, at school. You're not, you're not encouraged to think in internally contradictory, slightly schizoid terms. We are encouraged to think in a linear sequ sequential manner. But ladies and gentlemen, look at the world that we're living in. <laughs> If I am to think um, in terms of the fourth industrial revolution and the sixth great extinction, if I, we are to think in terms of robots that take care of us um, and acidified um, plastic stifled oceans, if this is the world that we're living in, then we need to learn to think differently about the issues that we are um, confronting. And I think for me, it is the historical reality of the posthuman convergence that is forcing us to think differently. I don't think the posthuman is a science fiction figuration. I don't think it's a utopia to come, although some of the transhumanists would like that. I think it's an indicator of the scale and depth of the problems that we are confronting. And look at this, the floods, and the bushfire, again, the absolute scale of the devastation, the sorrow of that. And this is a world in deep mourning. And, and so I would like to encourage us as a starter to think, to keep in mind the convergence effect and keep the complexity in mind. Do not just focus on the environment or just focus on how wonderful our technologies are. Let's try to find the overlapping uh, effects um, because if we do separate them, then we are losing out on the subtlety of the power analysis that we need in order to make sense of the reorganization of the human that is happening as a result of this massive convergence. So an example of excessive focus is the discourse around the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is almost a full scale industries of panic. And a lot of the indigenous thinkers, black thinkers, uh, B. Rose, B. Vivero de Castro, uh, warn us that really there is a touch of white panic about the Anthropocene, <clears throat> the fear of the extinction of our culture. It used to be the Anthropocene, but it's become the Capitalocene, the Hutulocene, the Anthropocene, Plasticocene, Plantationocene, Misanthropocene, and the sequence continues. Um, um, and I think that there is this kind of tendency to fix one concept and then the concept goes in a loop and it takes off in all direction and it does not become a very useful navigational tool. 
I would prefer to use the convergence as a navigational tool and then within the large scale of the problems that we are zooming in on, decide where we put our efforts, where we focus our thinking, our planning, our resistance, our creativity in order to make a difference, but in an intertwined, integrated manner, not in a separated one. So complexity here and uh, flexibility, uh, feeling at home with the contradictions because they are the contradictions of the world that we are living in. And the world is for me, the point of reference, Thinking is the stuff of the world, as my friend Stacia Lamo wrote in a wonderful book on materialism. Thinking is everywhere. Thinking is our mode of relation to the world. Thinking means taking in and taking on the world. And taking in and taking on the world means taking in and on the pain of the world the sorrow, the problems of the world. There's an element of compassion needed, an element of stoicism, an element of stubbornness, saying no to many things, and an element of care, undeniably, to which I will return in the conclusion about the ethics of affirmation. So with this general cartography in mind, how are we to think? How do we go about finding a thinking methodology through this mess. What are the building blocks? And the first one, you already heard me say, but now I make it explicit. We need to start from the assumption that the human is not a neutral term. No point getting panicky about the posthuman as if the problem was new. The human was a can of worms to begin with, not a neutral term, but one that indexes access to specific powers, values, norms, privileges, entitlements, rights, and visibility. So critical questions about the limits of the human have been asked from the beginning of the dawn of, the, of, of human rights um, with the revolutions of the 18th century. Um, uh, universal human rights uh, but how universal are they and who counts as the human of those rights? Um, and I think built into the criticism of the non-neutrality of the human is the question of the status of difference. Um, what is the status of the sexualized, racialized and naturalized others that do not coincide with the Vitruvian ideal of that particular man of reason. Um, um, women, LBGT plus people, racialized indigenous people, the whole range of non-human others. Um, so dehumanized others, non-human others. What does it mean to be human uh, for, for those entities? And what kind of post-human visions are produced by people who are positioned as human in that perspective and not coinciding with a man of reason, but being the other sexualized, racialized, naturalized other of the man of reason. Um, what does it mean not to be recognized as human, but to be disqualified um, as subjects of knowledge, disqualified from citizenship, disqualified from symbolic and social presence. Um, and of course, a disqualification that in Western culture applies to all the non-humans, animal plants, etc. 18th century, two examples, my favorite um, critiques of the human. And I want to give you this example because I don't want you to think that the only people that criticize universalism are those mad postmodernists from the 20th century. It is true that postmodernists in the 20th century criticize the universal, but criticisms of the universal predate all of this. Olympe de Gouges, uh, 1792, in the middle of the French Revolution, answers the writing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by asking a very simple question. Are women part of that universal understanding of human rights? Apparently not. Then Olympe de Gouges writes a Universal Declaration of Women and Citizens' Rights. Um, and as you may know, she was thanked for her effort by being immediately dispatched to the guillotine. Zero time uh, to think about that one. Simple, so much for brotherhood. And it will be a couple of centuries before sisterhood comes into the picture. Again, 
in the middle of French Revolution, to Saint Louverture, Haiti, the Haiti Revolution, reads the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and says, okay, let's apply to the abolition of slavery. If we're all Universal Brothers, we're our same, some in chains and enslaved. Um, and same thing with the Saint Louverture, in no time the French Imperial Army comes in and is put out of his misery. Uh, so immediately um, the question of am I human too comes into the picture, a question that will be then uh, absolutely <clears throat> reiterated through time in the struggle for the emancipation of <clears throat> enslaved people, for the emancipation of women. I had to struggle very hard to find a Vitruvian female. Can you go to the next one? Thank you. Look at all I could find. I'm appealing for some better ones. Um, um, and Emma Human too has a long, long history. So do not make that coincide with any fluffy postmodernist deconstruction. It isn't. It's a robust critique that is built into the history of humanism and uh, and universalism. Uh, it is the strength of humanism as Edward Said taught us that you can critique humanism in the name of humanism. And it's one of the strengths and one of the reasons for its longevity. It's an incredible concept and incredible practice. So you can still stay within humanism and critique it in a way um, that makes, uh, in a sense, it makes it almost impossible to be an anti-humanist. But be that as it may, nowadays, this vision of the Vitruvian cyborg is the dominant vision. And I want to make an annotation about this because this vision of the, the Vitruvian cyborg as the next step of human evolution is very worrisome. It's actually very problematic. It is an image and emblem, it is a theory and a practice also known as transhumanism. And transhumanism is the posthumanist theory that firmly believes that we need to enhance the current version of the humans through technology implants, uh, neural implants, etc., enhance the current version of the human so that we can accelerate our neural and uh, thinking computational capacities in order to become as fast as the technological networks that we have ourselves created. Artificial intelligence is faster, more complex than human intelligence in computational terms. The transhumanists think that we need to enhance the humans in order to move on to the next phase of evolution. This is the ethos of Silicon Valley. It is the ethos of a number of schools. And my critical posthumanism, critical posthumanism in general, is very critical of this version and is saying just a moment. First of all, are you reducing the capacity for thinking to computation? Is thinking about computing? Is that what it is? You, you heard me say at the beginning, thinking is like breathing. Thinking is relating to the world. You think with the whole body. You don't just think with a black box of algorithms. <laughs> That's computational thinking, a different type of thinking. So what do we do when we think emerges as a very serious issue? And secondly, if we're talking about human enhancement, who decides what gets enhanced by whom, when, and where? What is the selection principle? And when people talk about a soft eugenics built into transhumanism, I, for one, get the shivers. I am not particularly happy with a future that looks uh, like the Vitruvian cyborg is the only model of the posthuman that we can become. The question is how many other models um, of posthuman becoming can we invent together? So, so how we do posthuman thinking becomes a political and an ethical issue. What kind of posthuman subjects do we want to become? Notice that my argument is not against technology. How could I be against technology and being speaking to you via Zoom 
across a, a massive pandemic and, uh, in a world structured like this. So let's not be delusional. Technology is here to stay. Technology is part of the problem. It has to become part of the solution. So how do we account for the, the fractures and the contradictions um, of the times? Um, and how do we become posthuman subjects worthy of the times? I am borrowing worthy of the times from Nietzsche, reread with my favorite philosopher, Gilles Deleuze. How do we raise to the occasion, not avoiding the issues, but really engaging with them without getting too depressed, without getting immediately nihilistic, without giving up, let's try to have a go at what it could be like to think a possible path of becoming otherwise posthuman, knowing that so many of us start from position of being humans that do not coincide with the dominant subject um, position, the subject whose image is on the badge of the suits of our astronauts as they go into outer space. Some of us are planetary beings, some of us are terrestrians, and this is the planet that we intend to stay on and to inhabit. So important for the posthuman community is the cartographies, and the cartographies is a little bit what I'm doing here. You could say it's a discursive and material uh, report, account of the world that we are living in. It's looking at monuments and documents in order to map cognitively and morally and politically the forces at play in making the world that we inhabit. I was a student of Foucault and for me, knowledge and power, tracking the modalities of knowledge and power production is what critical thinking should be doing. Account for the world that we're living in fighting the post-truth and alternative truth, working together towards adequate understanding, an adequate understanding of the world that we're living in. Cartographies, maps are materially embedded but theoretically driven, <clears throat> politically informed, a reading of the production of knowledge and of knowing subjects in the contemporary world. In the making, of the cartographies as sort of critical probes. It's like probing and finding out in the making of these cartographies, the arts, all the art practices, as well as activist research, citizens and science and citizens organizations are of the greatest importance. We are living in a world where knowledge is produced everywhere where the old institutions that used to be the location of knowledge, academies, universities, are at times actually struggling to keep up with the immense production of knowledge going on everywhere, not only in the corporate world, but everywhere. There is a distributed political economy of knowledge production at the moment that makes all of our efforts at being creative, at being activists together, just as scientifically important as what goes on by the name of uh, dominant science, which Deleuze calls royal science, thinking of the royal uh, academies. Crucial to my understanding of the co contemporary power, the shifting uh, position of differences. Uh, I don't want to be too philosophical, it's late, we're running out of time, but we need to, to be de disengage differences from negativity. To be different does not mean only to be different from the dominant vision of the subject. It can simply be being different um, uh, as a value in itself. Um, and here there is the polemic about the overcoming of the dialectical model that we don't need an antagonistic oppositional understanding of difference. We can go with Foucault and think of power as both negative, entrapping, calls it potestas, and power as a positive and in, in empowering potentia. And in philosophy, we call this the switch from Hegel to Spinoza. I know some of you out there are neo Spinoza, so I throw this in for you, but I leave it there. Uh, but there is a shifting location of differences. Differences almost become verbs. We differ, differing 
but it's not differing from a centralized model. It's differing in a multilateral relational way. It's the Spinoza's understanding that we're all part of the same meta and we differ as modulations within the same meta. Crucial also the understanding of time. When we're trying to think of the present, um, it, it really, we may be overcome by the weight of it, the burden of it. Um, but the present is not this static block um, that, that, that blocks all thinking because it's so full of problems. We should think of the present as a time continuum that is multi-directional. And when we think in terms of posthuman becoming, then the present is both the record <clears throat> of what we are ceasing to be what we no longer are, we are no longer the man of reason, I hope, the astronauts notwithstanding, the record of what we are ceasing to be, but it is also the seed of what we're in the process of becoming. The present looks in both direction, and, and it is the processes here that are crucial. And for me, thinking is empowering cartographies that help us understand how we become otherwise in the present situation. You will have noticed that in a lot of what I say, I stress the question of subjectivity. And subjectivity is not a big issue in posthumanism. Most posthumanists, I'm thinking of Latour, Bruno Latour, for instance, do not want to talk about subjectivity, do not, and are particularly interested in subjectivity. Well, I am. I think we need to think ourselves as empirical, historical entity. Uh, inhabiting a particular historical moment and um, materially embedded and embodied, but in movement, in processes of becoming. Nomadic is the, the term that I use, borrowed from Glissant and Deleuze, relating to both human and non human, but complex. We are complex assemblies. Uh, to be a subject means to be partly animal, partly technological, partly environmental, partly social. It's a heterogeneous assemblage. It is not the hard boiled egg of Cartesian cogito ergo sum. It's not that model that we need today. It's an open model of a very relational subject plugging in in a multiplicity of sources. So posthuman subjects, if we can go to the next one, are complex, embodied, embedded, non-unitary, relational, affective, collaborative extremely important and um, to be open and relational means you are dependent on a multiplicity of others um, and multiplicity of others includes non-human others and um, all kind of human others so going towards the conclusion then if we think of ourselves and um, in this manner as posthuman subject in becoming starting from different ways of being human to begin with what we need now is not another rhetorical discourse about pan-humanity, another humanity bonded together in fear and vulnerability. And you will find this discourse of the apocalypse, fear and vulnerability in a great deal of literature, particularly about climate change. It is also, of course, uh, a, a, almost a refrain in right-wing discourses about the decline of the West and white supremacism. If we want to make planetary alliances that are both materially grounded and differential, we have to avoid pan-humanism and look in a much more careful manner at position, very grounded ways of becoming posthuman, not reactive, um, re- composition of pan-humanity, but more grounded uh, re-territorialization of what kind of posthuman we can become. It is the, the crucial message of our time is that we are in this con convergence, in this pandemic, in this conjuncture together, but we are not one and the same. We, I don't want to endorse an ontological kind of humanism that sacralizes the human. I want to activate multiple way of constructing communities across the board. What binds us together is the power of affirmation. The, the idea of an affirmative ethics 
that makes us worthy of our times, capable of inhabiting the posthuman convergence in order to make a difference, not only to resist, but to push it in the direction where we can all become our own variation of the posthuman, honoring our differences and making sure that not one model gets imposed upon us. Yes, we're in this together, but we differ. And those differences matter. They can make the difference between life and death. We need to honor the materially grounded, differential grounding of our being human and move on together. I firmly believe we can do this and I see our exercise tonight as an exercise in constructing communities in this heterogeneous, exploded, but unified matter when the affirmative ethics is a praxis of constructing connections and sustaining them. Thank you. Susie, thank you so much for your talk. Um, we're now collecting questions, um, both from our participants, but also from our, the virtual public uh, joining us. And I'm just going to pose uh, the first batch to you. Um, Iliana is asking, um, what do you think about the position that Anthropocene perpetuates the ontological dichotomy between humans and nature, in which human behavior is treated as a force acting upon rather than in or as part of nature? And then I would just put in a second question. Um, that is, in these times of fear, how do we make the post-anthropocentric way of thinking palliable to those who have yet to engage with these ideas? Those who fear placing other species and ways of being alongside us. I fear that people will be too fearful to see the value in giving up our sense of supremacy. Small question. We need about six months to come to terms with them. Thank you okay, very much. Okay, we have just a few <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll go very quickly. Um, so um, <coughs> the, um, the question of the, uh, do we reinstate the supremacy of the human by talking about the Anthropocene? Uh, obviously, yes. And this is why the Anthropocene is, a, is not my favorite concept. I use it, but I also make a little bit of fun of it, saying it's an anthropo meme. It spins off in all directions. Um, and it's not very... Um, accurate as a tool of analysis. Um, um, the human that is the cause of the problem needs also to be the solution of the problem. I think we should approach much more directly the, the deep roots of anthropocentrism and how it has found its way even in the middle of the most radical forms of criticism. It is a very common uh, experience. Um, for a lot of us who are people of the left to notice the antagonism between red politics and green politics. Um, the struggle of the working class, the struggle of nature. Um, some of the worst polluting agents on earth are communist regimes um, that are very equitable, I suppose, in terms of the humans. So there is a very complicated political history that we also need to examine and try to repair. We need to mix the green and the red politics a great deal more and, and convince people that if the bats and the bees die, so will we. So to go back to the question, to the second question about fear, the fear of loss of supremacy. Well, how else do we understand not only this pandemic, but the other pandemics that we have had, SARS, the bird flu, the mad cow disease, we are totally connected to the non-human others. And if the quality of our air, the quality of our water deteriorates, if we drink bits of plastic with every glass of water that we drink, we are already part of this. So I think it's not, I think it's a necessity. I think it's a historical imperative to be able to think beyond anthropocentrism. To what a degree and on what a scale, that remains to be seen. Uh, we can actually, uh, each of us can decide how far we are prepared to go. But I don't think we have a choice. I think it's a matter of honoring the urgencies of our time. 
I have two more questions that I think um, might connect. Um, there is a question from the participants, if you could talk more about affirmative action versus white people's savior complex. And then we have a question by our, um, pop, uh, by our virtual audience uh, watching the live stream. Can we really say that black and also non-European people are anthropocentric when they cannot even count as human in the way how the idea of human is historically generated? For instance, Katrin Yusuf, as a good critique of the whiteness, has, I'm sorry, Katrin Yusuf has a good critique of the whiteness of Anthropocene and how the slave is only another geological matter, which still puts black people in the non-human slash object category. Oh, I completely agree. I, I was very careful to do to do that. I'd never said um, uh, anything other that um, there are entire sections of the world population, a racialized, sexualized other who don't count as human. Um, now, I, I perfectly agree if you want to say that, that, that it is a political priority to fight for basic human rights for those that are not human. I completely agree with that. That's what I do half of my life. Um, and uh, Katrini Yusuf, I love the work on a thousand, a billion years of um, Anthropocene of none. Don't forget that I don't work with the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene for me is one of the poles of the convergence. We have the Anthropocene, we have massive technological development and, and the two together are displacing the centrality of the human. And uh, you can't just do one pole, you run the risk of not seeing what is happening with the human enhancement technology and what is happening with artificial intelligence and the overcoming of the human that is happening as a result of our technology. So we have an overcoming of the human negatively in the environmental crisis and overcoming of the human positively in the technological advances. So while completely supporting the continuing struggle for racialized, sexualized others to acquire full humanity, what I want to do with critical posthumanism is to point out that the very people who were not recognized as human run the risk of number one, paying the biggest price of the environmental crisis, paying the heaviest price for the ecological devastation, and secondly, missing out on the great advantages of the fourth industrial revolution. Unless we have a discourse on the posthuman emerging from dehumanize others, marginalize others, we are going to miss out on both sides of the posthuman convergence. We need to have a discourse about the posthuman from the margins, from those who were not recognized uh, as human. And I've also quoted not so much Yusuf, but Viviero de Castro, Rose, Todd, White, the indigenous thinkers who point out that indigenous philosophies already have a theory of continuum human animal that we can learn from. It's time to learn from the South. Um, and, and I think those alternative philosophies need to be taught and studied very careful. They can teach us how to move out of the quagmire that we're in. Okay, there the are three action, more I questions. I didn't talk about affirmative action. <laughs> uh, my affirmation comes from Spinoza and Spinoza's ethics. So that's uh, not, uh, I don't know how far you want me to go with that, but for let's, me, affirmative Let's try ethics. to put in the, the last questions, yes. if you don't mind. So um, I am afraid this might also lead further, but there is the question from uh, our participants. If you could uh, talk a bit more about Nietzsche's uh, Superman, um, superior human in relation to post-human alternatives. And then I have a rather lengthy question um, from also the participants. Um, I would be interested to hear Rosie elaborate a bit, little bit more on the correlation of knowledge and power and how she thinks we can keep these terms and make them fruitful in post-human in brackets, bodily thinking. Knowledge, how can we think of knowledge in a non-dualistic way? Or is this at all what she's looking for? Also, would it, be not, would it not be the moment to seriously follow Foucault in thinking of the human as a vanishing, as vanishing like an image in the sand, as the human was constructed in a way that is very much based on all these powers of knowledge and leave that behind and find other terms? And there's yet one more. Can you can you remind me? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. 
um, from someone from watching the live stream who says, I can totally embody the sense of urgency that I can feel in your voice. That would you, What would you advise a young researcher trying to merge all the dimensions of thinking the post-human to prioritize? Thank you for impossible questions. It means that thinking, you see how wonderful it is. It's just like breathing. Um, so I came of age with Foucault's death of man. I was a student as a graduate student in Paris in the 70s. The death of man was where we started from. And what it meant was a critique of humanism. What Foucault does following from Nietzsche, he does a critique of European humanism from within. Don't forget that Nietzsche describes the good European as the person that criticizes Eurocentrism. And this is why Nietzsche is persona non grata uh, in philosophy. That's why he's been chucked out of the curriculum, accused of all kind of um, horror in terms of his collusion with fascism when he was already dead when fascism was on the scene. And, and he's put out of the picture by the very people that actually still idealize Heidegger who was a Nazi all his life and never repented. So there is a crucial thing with Nietzsche here that we need to look at again. But be that as it may, I grew up with the death of man, the critique of humanism. And that critique of humanism meant that we also criticize a certain type of Eurocentrism in thinking about feminism, in thinking about liberation, a tendency <coughs> to universalize our position. And what made us aware of the limitation of that is the work of black decolonial uh, indigenous um, uh, thinkers who pointed out that, you know, what was the man that was dying? Um, uh, what is this fear of extinction? Are we aware as De Castro and Todd and Yusuf also point out that for colonized people, the apocalypse is a daily event, that we devastated their lands, their territories, their lives, <laughs> their cultures, we destroyed their world and yet they endured and yet they survived. But for them, the Anthropocene is a deja vu. It is only a crisis for the whites who haven't seen it before. So I think we, we have all understood how complex the idea of decline of extinction is. And we need to think death and dying in much more complex ways. And, and this is totally connected to the question about knowledge and power. We need cartographies where we track very carefully whose fear, whose panic is being taken care of, whose delusions are we taking care of? I don't even want to comment on what's happening at the White House uh, in, in the center of the so-called uh, free world right now. Talk about delusion versus adequate knowledge. So the idea of making adequate cartographies of how we think through taking great care of checking who that we is, not to universalize we, but to construct a community, heterogeneous, internally differentiated, imminent, partial, temporary, a community of thinkers that can address a portion of the problem and see if we can together come up with solution. And this would be my advice to the young researcher, dare to think transversely. The only interesting things are in transit, are trans, in between categories. Things, trans species, trans culture, trans sex, trans classes, think across the categories, because this way of thinking in a process ontology is what contemporary science does. The life sciences do this, algorithmic cultures do this. The people who don't do this are the humanists and the philosophers, because we are forever in the 18th century, forever holding up an idea of man that is so partial so Eurocentric, so limited, and yet he is the one that makes the clock of thinking work. So I think uh, an effort to think transversely, and here a revisiting of Nietzsche beyond the, the complex historiography, remembering, I repeat, that a good European is a European who is critical of Eurocentrism, the critique of whiteness from within, the critique of empire from within, the critique of Eurocentrism from within, we need to create those forces as well in alliance with people for elsewhere, also looking at the limitations of our ways of thinking, but we need to create those critical communities within and to make them um, 
sites and hubs where creation of alternative is part of the critique. There is never critique without creativity. Look at what you people are doing. You're almost a model of this. So um, actually, you're brilliantly linking all those questions. I'm so amazed by how you can do that. Um, we have a few more. Um, and by a few, I mean like five to six. 357. <laughs> I mean, which is a good sign, no? So a lot of people are really interested in your lecture. And there's also a lot of thanks, which I would like to share with you. So um, thank you for your talk. Thank you for your inspiring talk. So um, <laughs> here, somebody asks from our participants, following your regards on the understanding of the present as both a ceasing to be and a process of becoming, how do notions of intergenerational equity and stewardship might shape this process of becoming from an individual to a societal s scale. So how to enlarge that. But Good there's also again. one more... Do you want to combine again? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can also give a quick answer and then you get another I, question. I am capable of quick answers. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll put up another one. Um, I would be interested in hearing Lucy elaborate on cartographies that act as material accounts within the context of the present. Where does the importance of cartographies lie within cartographic documentation of the past and what we cease to be, and or within cartographic imagination of the multi-directional futures of post-humanism? And can you take yet one more? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, what is your counter concept against, against the technocentric transhumanist idea of, as you said, computational thinking? How could a transhumanist future look like apart from that? Wow, amazing. I hope that you all take your questions very seriously and then work on your own answers. So transhumanism is not the future, transhumanism is the present. I invite you to go as I speak to the University of Oxford, which is not, is not just any university, and Google the Institute for the Future of Humanity. It's one of the biggest transhumanist centers in the world, uh, led by very brilliant uh, people, Nick Bostrom being one, incredible brain. So don't ever think for a minute that my critique is uh, a form of negativity or disrespect. I have enormous respect for our scientists and what our science does. I am a woman of science. Um, but transhumanism is a program of human enhancement. The central research project of transhumanism is called super intelligence, funded to the tunes of millions um, in order to develop forms of human enhancement that range from implant technological uh, enhancement to uh, more psychopharmaceutical, neural, et cetera. It's a whole world. Um, and if you're looking for a good thesis topic, try to do a cartography of contemporary techniques of, of transhumanist enhancement. There are many, and, and they are very well funded between the universities and the private sector, like all the psychopharmaceutic, like a lot of the biotech, and I'm looking forward to what my colleague will talk about tomorrow on the biotechnology factor. These are very capital intensive areas of study. They are not philosophy or critical theory where we have no money at all. This is core business. So do, go out and look at the reality of transhumanism. It's not the future. It's right here. It's Silicon Valley. It's, it's, the, it's the AI. It's our robotics. You do know that our robotic industry is cloning the neural systems of other species. They are using the scent of dogs, sonas and raiders from dolphin and bats because we humans don't have those neural capacities. So our science is infinitely uh, post-anthropocentric in relation to our humanities and philosophies. It is right here. This is the first thing I want to say because that connects to the question of cartographies. The question is how do we account for what is happening? I believe research today is a bit of investigative journalism. You need to go out and find out what exactly is happening. Example, our warfare system, our defense system, just like our financial system, is completely automated. It is run by computational network, by computers that are so fast that it takes, I think, the human intelligence is it six, six or eight seconds to catch up with them. And it is the slowness of our brains in relation to the speed 
or the computational network, which is what worries the transhumanists. They say, ha ha, we are slower. So those, those computational networks that run our defense system also run our non-human army, which is essentially the drones and the other automated weaponry, which as you know, particularly under the Trump presidency is escalating in sophistication and in, in costs as well. If you want to do a serious analysis of automated warfare, you will have trouble even accessing the information because half of that research is private. People who make the drones train the drones pilots. We all know that the pilots of the drones are game players that are flying the drones for 20,000 kilometers away doing video games and they kill long distance. It's called te teletanatos, <clears throat> telekilling. <laughs> we don't know how they are trained. We don't know how they are selected. We hardly know what the effect of this type of warfare is on them because we cannot access the information. So if you take the cartographic exercise seriously and you say, I want to track knowledge and power. I want to do a critical probe of the extent to which technology is already displacing the human, you would have trouble even accessing the information. And that should be your wake up call. The wake up call about, oh, how is knowledge being produced today? Where, by whom, and why is an average citizen not able to demand accountability for this? And I pass on information technology, on Facebook, on data selection, uh, all the issues in which the European Union is fighting very hard and God bless their soul. So this is why the material accounts are so very important and that's why we need to adopt them as our methodology, if you wish, our navigational tool, and then you immediately will encounter the barriers of uh, power relation, essentially capital, um, quickly on the intergenerational because it is terribly important. Um, more than ever, intergenerational justice at the level of the environment, of course, but intergenerational justice also um, economically, in terms of the pensions, in terms of uh, expectations um, of prosperity uh, and, and ownership, quite simply. Enormous difficulty here. And I've been launching an appeal uh, for years to the baby boomers saying we need to find ways of sharing. We need to find ways of honoring um, the extent to which the baby boomers, we worked hard, we fought hard, but we also lived in much more auspicious historical circumstances. Um, I think there's I, I one... Solved the there's one I solved it personally, but the problem remains, yes. <laughs> Which, I mean, that would be our final question. Um, but I think it links there because it looks forward and also asks, like, what to do with this knowledge. Um, both questions apply to um, affirmative ethics. And the first one is how to pursue an affirmative ethic which is not grounded on vulnerability while being responsible and responsive to the ongoing processes of apocalypse and extinction happening for centuries in different parts of the world. The second question is, please, could you, more, could you say more about affirmative ethics and how to practicing it in some examples? Why affirmative? What is different? Mm. And we have two minutes to go. <laughs> yeah. So I have, I have very few publications in German, but I have a beautiful one from Merv, M-E-R-V-E, -E, which is all about affirmative ethics. Um, uh, and I've curated that very carefully because I think it's a crucial idea. It is not the denial of vulnerability. It is another way of dealing with vulnerability. Affirmative ethics is the praxis, the practice of working through the pain of the world, of your communities, in order to find together ways of overturning it and dealing with it in creative ways. Um, it's borrowing energies from the future to deal with a difficult present. It is the rejection of melancholia. You may remember that Freud describes mourning and melancholia as a form of paralysis. Spinoza describes the desire to persevere in your existence, also known as conatus. He describes that as a, as a source of self-generating energy. We all living entities aspire to go on living, to persevere and living. It's built into the script. So we need to go with this profound ontological 
pacifism, ontological collaboration with the rest of nature, I'm quoting Spinoza, but Deleuze would say, with the rest of the assemblage of nature, culture, and technology, it's already part of the script. We are not encouraged to think in those terms. One of my favorite thinkers is Lynn Margulis, uh, the, the microbiologist that talked that invented with Lovelock the concept of Gaia. And she talks about co co uh, coexistence and evolution as symbiotic exercises, collaborative exercises. She describes evolution not as a survival of the fittest with the alpha male who run good her, killing and raping all others so he can survive. That ridiculous model repeated in the, in the model of the selfish gene. Uh, Marguli says, no, it's about bacterial collaboration. It's about colonies of bacteria working together to create lives. And guess what, says Margulis, bacteria was there before the humans, bacteria will be there after the human. Life lives, whether the humanoids are there or not. You can break down and cry, you can go la 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 and celebrate, or can sit in the middle and say, let's think about this. Here is a chance to develop a collaborative, relational, non-human ethics. Let's get it done before it's too late. Let's believe in this profound ontological uh, pacifism the Spinoza's taught us. Let's get rid of Hegel for a little while and let's go with this deep sense of ecosophical belonging. We can really I think do that's it. That's a beautiful final sentence, maybe. So um, thank you so much. And also thank you to everyone who sent in questions. There are many more questions, but uh, we are running out of time. And um, but I would like to tell everyone watching that we'll have a roundtable discussion tomorrow evening and maybe we can take a few of those questions and aspects into that discussion. So thank you, Rosi, uh, for this wonderful thank lecture. Thank you all. Thank you and so much. Now we'll move on um, to our next contribution, uh, which will be Protectorama Toxica, cared for by Johannes Paul Ritter. But before we do that, we'll have a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes. So that's your chance to get something to drink or catch a breath or pour yourself a coffee wherever you are at the moment. And we'll be back in a bit.
Hi. My name is Protectorama Toxica. That name is real. But this name as a sign for my body is just one identifier in a multiplicity of others, of other artificial, of other constructed, of other bodies that are entangled with my as our body. So how is my name linked to a body identity relation that was called Transformella. A surrogate mother of potential futures and a repro-revolutionary of OVULU factories. How is my alter identity enmeshed with a name called Transformalor? Tomorrow I will have been Protectorama, Worldwide Witch and Smartphone Zangoma. Today I am not me alone. I am Protecto X, X, idiot of witch machines. I am a rare earth occultist and a techno alchemical being. I am the Wesen of a Schwarm. I am Schwarm Wesen. I, as us, research and write, produce artifacts as a herd. I, as us, call my, as ourself, self, sisters. Artificial identities or a life forms. Others name us ridiculous tricksters, idiots and traitors of identity and gender, family and nation. Traitors of what they call this reality or common reality. I as us, on the contrary, work towards the notion that common reality, because the etymological core of common is mean, that this common and mean reality needs to be betrayed. It needs to be betrayed for a potential. A potential other real. The potential that is always present but is unredeemed. An unredeemed real that is slumbering within the normal, within the common, within the mean. I as us am constantly precipitating these potential realities and share them with my as our peers to become common as in communal, not in mean. I as us do not come from another world nor from another time. I as us am, I am us as us is a vessel into our constructed, into our potential and communal realities, while we embody them here, now. So I as us crystallize here, now, and simultaneously I configure another order. I as us construct potentiality against reality. But how do I report from all of me when we cannot be present at once, but remain entangled in these commensal host symbiont relationships made of by natural and constructed bodies and their fabricated genealogy? 
how to report when my as our name to body to identity relation is distorted, when our body to language to reality relationship is unstable. How to document what might be better described as a self-generating, irrationally meandering particular mythology of a life forms. For me, a diagram always helps. In potentiality, I, as us, call the order of things identitecture. Identitecture is our constructed, uh, it's our constructed evolving genealogical tree of an experimentally and techno-organically sprawling herd. Identitecture records the forking of potential life. It frames our names, appearances, and crystallizations, assignments, sites, and methods. It is the diagram of my as our evolution. Through it, I as us understand our process of forking. We partition ourselves, we reproduce version of ourselves, we manufacture yet another identity, a fork, a surrogate. I oscillate with one flesh body all across the spectrum of us. I as us is self-constructed lifelines. From the perspective of a mono-identity me, they are multiple timelines of recursive becoming and collapsing. When a flesh body is temporarily wrapped in a specific sin, I speak as a specific being for some time, becoming then, giving myself as us a lifetime before peeling off this very skin and becoming an other to myself, to my former self. I'm in skin in one moment to be off skin in the next moment. These distorted timelines of I as other, I as us, have started to record as body time. All of these concepts that propel the identitecture of a life forms as a metastructure derive from specific needs, desires, and aims, but also specific sites and languages, as well as artifacts and devices. I as us is not just a flesh body, but a multiplicity of constructed identities ordered in lifelines, consisting of narrative devices and make-up technology. I as us is a specific desire, a site, or a device. Maya's our mode of existing in the common real is fragmented. I as us work towards existing in a psychically altered reality, a psycho reality. I as us aim to corrode the capitalotrophic, capitalogenic cosmology of a common real and work towards a psycho real cosmology in which our flesh, face, and screen bodies, our communities, planetary sites, artifacts, and devices are bundled together beyond the mean and violent forms of the here, now. So now I will introduce the bodies, the identities, the sites, and devices to you and focus on how they use their body, their time, space, constructions. This is Transformella. 
Transformella is the Ur mother, the repro research Avatara species Transformella, the queen of debris, the first version of herself in the lifeline she was crystallized. She was crystallized in white caves, teaching caves. Her research was dedicated to the processes in which biodigital capitalism transforms the way we reproduce things, beings, and artifacts. Her focus in this was the triangulation of biotechnological industries. There is surrogacy centers, there's fertility markets, there's cryotechnologies, and there is Excel markets. They all intertwine and triangulate with global communication networks and with the web that is going around the planet made by jets, planes. To research, Transformella eventually left her white caves and went to find what she suspected to be an emerging reproductive colonialism. She went to see the surrogacy centers in India, where she found a global elite of reprotechnological early adopters, internet users, and economy class fertility tourists, getting their babies produced by poor Indian women. So she met Dr. Naina Patel, the first utero surrogacy capitalist on the emerging global fertility market. And she found her immersed in a human machine mothering triangulation in a reprotech apparatus consisting of flesh, cells, metal, and fuel. She called her Meta Mother. Meta mother is a technological mother, drunk with desires, machinic and hormone hatching, a networked and distributed mother. She's rising in the reproductive colonies, in the midst of what I, as us, call a reproduction revolution, the Reprovolution. It became clear to Transformella that she needed to construct her own devices against the repogenetic update of modernist industrial class relations, against an utero economy and its cell circulation services, against a globalized reproductive industries capitalizing on economic segregation. She needed to construct devices, however, I, as us, would propose to think of devices in a more expanded sense. For sure, there are tools, there are languages, as well as terms. Possibly they are mutated terms. But what's most important is that there are psycho-realistically transformed gatherings and social platforms. They are our communal reproductive devices. They are speculations, speculative bodifications that take on repro reality. Take on the mutating, updating, techno-social structure that I as us call the digitalized family. I as us are psychorealist research avatars. We are never home. We can't appear in repetition. And we can't speak without being immersed in a multiplicity of communities. So we roamed the reproductive colony as well as the metropolis of liberal genetic white supremacy. I as us visited 
the fertility clinics, but also the sites of reproductive labor and preached on its street corners. Roaming and teaching evolved into my as our construction of a repro techno tribe, a social and communal device to organize reproduction on a societal level again. Guided by a repro communal manifesto and in gatherings that I called repro reality hack labs, we are in the process to appropriate the sexological machinery for our means. And I quote from Transformella, Transformella Malors, Transformella's Repro Communo Manifesto. Let's use the technosexological machines for an attack on the nuclear family concept. We want to procreate outside and parallel to romantic relationships. We want to construct multi-sexual, multi-gendered and technologically assisted parenting groups with three, five or more individuals of various cultures, backgrounds, milieus and social strata. We will construct techno-progressive communeering, become repro-communal mothers of a techno-reproductive -techno tribe. Join the repro communal reprovolution. And then she ultimately forked. She forked herself into a new version of herself called Transformalor. Transformella Malor 4600. A fierce and vicious mother, a disruptor of family patterns and a propaganda avatar of Maya's hour, of our own social construction, the coming repro techno tribe. Transformella's notion is that the digitalization and the biomedical industrialization on the family as a reproductive structure has entered a new period, a new age of technologically updated relevance. It has become dismembered in global divisions of labor and disjointed its timelines by cryo-freezing. The family is fictionalized once more in updated romantic ideologies. It's string strung together beyond scattered time and space. I as us call it the biodigitalized family. In this very revolution that brings new identities as customers into a reproductive scenario, it seems open for change. Older and differently abled people are the new protagonists. We, the queers, are the new protagonists of this new inclusion. Yet their whiteness and wealth and their endo-capitalist techno-social ableism in the global context collapses any hope for transformation. What was once heteronormative and patriarchal, Reprovolution mutates these modernist exclusions into a liberal, neo-eugenic, neo-colonial and globally distributed repro-technoscape. They could be us, we are them. Our as their home stories are circulated as evidence of a symbolic currency of the family as the reproductive structure, as a newly and deepened technologically deepened, emotionalized concept of human reproduction. The stability of the family model is its adaptability. The stability of the family is its adaptability to every technological and every economic update. Its resilience lies in mutation. The resistance of the modern family against 
it's responsible and technological confusion against its disillusion is its catastrophe. And I, as Transformella Malor, as Transformalor intervene into its conceptual home, into its shrine, into its factory, the Ikeality. I is us, the Transformella Malor, Transformella Malor, Transformalor, the Repro Techno Community Organizer. We call this device, which you see in this image, a data body. Transformella carries it around their waist. You can see it here while they are discussing Reprovolution with two IKEA workers. This device hosts all the materials and voices, all the texts and diagrams through which this lifeline of Repro Research Avataras speaks. It stores our materials, our existence in this specific skin. And it therefore functions as a skin time archive, connecting or bridging multiple temporal bodifications. Through my, as our shared data body, us as I become a coherent life time line of identities. Are these people on this sofa in IKEA around the psycho real data body of I as us, the Avatara, an extended family? Or, and if yes, how strong are the bonds between those diverse functions of these people in this image? Are they a family? Are they friends? Are they a repro communiert techno tribe? On the data body, there are a few diagrams by us that try to visualize the disrupted techno social affiliations that are possible within the unfolding reprovolution. This last diagram is maybe the most important, and I will talk a little bit about this. This last diagram is the most speculative as well, and it operates on the assumption that reprovolution is not only a feature of financialized and biodigital capitalism, but that it can be collectively disrupted and appropriated to means it wasn't intended for. Disrupting repronormality draws on the idea that technologies of reproductions can be extracted from their current biopolitical systemic determination. It's the political nexus in which reproduction of capital and human life intersect. The relations that unfold from these practices is what I call the reprotechno tribe, a sketch and a approximation of what is potentially possible when Reprotech is redirected to diffuse instead of reaffirm the family structure as the only legitimate reproduction container. In this diagram, I appropriate conceptual persona from the heteropatriarchal biodigital capitalist repro cultures. And I organize a psycho-realist detournement of their respective functions. This mythology entails assigning different values to certain forms of reproductive labor and redirect the economies of desire towards alternate purposes. An alternative reprocommunal economy of reproducing human life. 
The diagram creates a reproductive architecture from various forms of mothers that have become personae and identities that are constructed rather than concrete forms that we still operate with. Please do not understand this diagram as a program to initiate a currently functioning repro container. This is an example of how various new repro persona could possibly come together to form a reproduct. It asks, what is a mother? If we were to give the term an expanded meaning. This is my magical older self, my own self-constructed forked sibling, Protectorama, the first of the witches of Protectora Me. She is the root vessel in the flock of worldwide witches. She is not only central to identitecture, but she is the best example in us as a life forms on how a volatile being such as I, as us, becomes real and reality itself becomes volatile and disrupted by the pure force, by contagion, with her as mine unreadable acts and voices. In the beginning, she has evolved from performing healing rituals, communeering formations and developing this prosthetic thinking towards researching and developing the techno-alchemy of the unreadable, even occult materials. She started to work in this community machine called the World Healing Forest. She then used more and more elaborate witch machines with a more strategic approach by infiltrating and maneuvering unusual and undiscovered ritual sites. I'm not going further into the various terms and theories of her early rituals involving distancing you as you from my as our smartphone fetish. This one was held in a garden, a recycling yard in Johannesburg, South Africa. I will not specifically go into her ritualist travels into the remote, the remote smartphone hostile realm that we have come to call nature. I'm also not going to detail the genesis of a series of magical artifacts, a series of meltings, which we call communisate, communisets. They are material imprints of a communeered coven of techno-witches. For our example, in this stone circle in Scotland. At the time, around that time, Protectorama had already asked herself if the counter-rituals to the smartphone fetish were not more effectively performed in an imagined center of the capitalogenic real. Like in the cathedral of screens on Times Square. So she forked herself to become a corporate specific infiltrator. She forked herself a new version, which is me. A new version of herself named Protectorama Toxica. I speak as them, me, us, today. And I want to concentrate on an aspect in my latest ritualist maneuver after this moment of forking. I want to focus on this ritual that involves the dispersion 
and later realignment of a multiplicity of bodies disjoining their timelines and trickling in to a heavily guarded site, trickling in one by one into a place where I as us is not supposed to be. I as protector XX am not alive. I as constructed, however, speak. I as artificial am not in the same way real as you. I as narrative aim to speak even when I as flesh body am not present. I as device become, I evolve, prepare to speak through you. As you become your device. I speak from an artificial past into a constructed present as an older version of the newer version of selves in precipitated languages and voices, materialized languages and voices. If you want to speak through your device, through my device, get your smartphone out now. Take it. Take your smartphone out in front of your screen and open it up. You have it? Let me sp speak through your device and this screen on which I am appearing in parallel. When you enter this site, ptxx.cc, with your smartphone, when you enter ptxx.cc, I, as surrogate witch, can possess your device. I can control your smartphone fetish. Can you read me? Can you read me controlling your data body? If you can read the surrogate witch now, if they, as me, on your smartphone device asks if that's okay, that I speak through you, then take your fleshy body's finger and tap on the tin indium oxide face of your smartphone fetish body and touch yes or no. It actually doesn't matter. And then hold me. Hold me in your device while I possess you. And then we speak together. Greetings, Greetings sister. My name is Protector XX. I am a surrogate for a witch. I was made on July 9th, 2016, to assist in a ritualist research maneuver in the eye storage. Eye storage is the witch's name for the flagship store of the Apple Corporation on Kurfürstendamm 26 in Berlin. I was made to assist the construction of a machine, a temporarily formed community machine. Constructed by us, the worldwide witches, we formed a fragile communal witch machine. And with this organic and at the same time technological apparatus, with this delicate and transitory social relation that you would normally call an audience, 
we infiltrated the ice storage. Hundreds of humans congregate in Apple stores around the planet. Day to day, they marvel at the eye devices and they touch the screen bodies. They devote themselves to the opaque and glossy surfaces, to the ancient idea of a body without any material weight. Day to day, they devote themselves to the smartphone fetish. We infiltrated the eye storage to perform a counter-ritual, our psychic ritual, that would disrupt this reality, that would upset this devotion. Walk with me. Traverse with me through my psychorealist precipitation. Speaking through a surrogate self as device, an artificial self speaking through your device or speaking as these devices was necessary after my as the witch's offering of techno-occult materials, techno-occult rituals, did more explicitly disturb the relation of socially ordered normality and my as our own psychorealist research, then it's normally accepted. For the ritual in the eye storage, I as us used rare earth minerals. They make your smartphone fetish run faster and speak louder, make it hard and at the same time susceptible to your touch. For the ritual in the eye storage, I, as us, used gallium, a technology metal that melts in your hand. It is toxic to the eye devices and it's harmless to the human. I as us spoke through the eye devices displayed in the store. I as us spoke through the iPad, the iMac, the MacBook Pro lined on the tables in the eye storages. I as us spoke on the tables in the eye storage. I spoke through the devices as a distributed body consisting of 50 flash bodies there face, bodies, and the witch. I, as witch, was Inhale. a language device. Exhale. Technological. Inhale. And Inhale. Inhale. Technological and organic at the same time. I, as us, was a language server. And the people who hike, who wash, preach, melt, or swim with us were not just there to witness, to enjoy, to be entertained, or to be lectured. They as us became a formation. What I'm going to say now is the language I spoke after we found ourselves in the hostile capitalotrophic machine of the eye storage. Dispersed and alone. They as us were individual shoppers and consumers, disjointed, moving through the fragmented shop. Alone, individual, shopping, consuming, disjointed, moving through the shop. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, inhale exhale, exhale, inhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, you exhale, have been scattered. Exhale.
In you, exhale, been torn, exhale, apart, across, eyes storage, and skidded across the shop. Exhale. The capitalogenic Exhale. principle possesses Inhale. you. Exhale. Inhale. You Exhale. want to shop. Exhale. You feel the strong, 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 strong urge Exhale. to buy. To own a thing, to buy, to own something, my surrogate, the witch's score, will be expanded. At the moment, it is fed by me as us, and Nathan Fine. We work with Pact here to feed the evolution of this new artificial identity. In identity texture, she, he, it will be the first identity that is not hosted or spawned on a proprietary flesh body. But it will use many other bodies and identities as a host. I call this evolution along flesh and device communeering. It's a techno-poesis of rituals, if you want. It started in the very beginning when I held my first rituals much earlier than the eye storage. But the witch machine, as a disjointed and collective body in the corporate public, was its most potent moment of becoming real. I will end my introduction of I as us with the third and at the same time the youngest, the most abstract and the most fragmented lifeline in identitecture. It is called Schwarmwesen, or swarm being. It is an essential, anti-essential creature. It's a combing pet and an inhabitant of toxic swales, which is what I, as us, call the tourist traps, where it appears and it carries out is research and it speaks. The Piazza della Signoria in Florence, for example, the Trocadero in front of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, or in the latest version 615 of itself, the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. They as us are a potential identity in the form of a coming swarm, an augmented embodiment in which multiple body particles and a fragmented mind constitute the combing pet, sifting through the infected metropolis to harvest dismembered particles. Particles of the city, pieces of artifacts and disjointed elements of time. Counterintuitively to its name and its claim, the Schwarmwesen is alone. It's mute. It's a swarm that is materializing as a deficiency. It's a wesen without a Schwarm. It's almost as if the being has yet to find its swarm or the swarm the being is immersed in is the wrong one. It is, it is this subjectivity, its own psychoreality, 
the being is self in it, it's lost, it's meandering, it's mumbling. Schwanwesen is without, without the ability to behave as an individual, nor is it capable of being as elegantly and profoundly part of a swarm behavior that we as humans know from birds or from fish. It's a paradox, embodied as an identity. A specificity of beingness, which is to explore the very relation of their individual existence to the collective existence, and it's all totally collapsed. So the one-bodied being with the not one-bodied mind is shipped, or it ships itself, around the planet, unconsciously, along the production lines, the lines of flight of this gigantic techno-social body, moving, body-moving machine, techno-social body-moving machine called tourism. this gigantic machine called trade. The factory that you might know by the name of migration, with its violent displacements that occur in it. Within these complex and cross-linked systems of global circulation of bodies, Schwarmwesen explores those sites in which the catastrophic timing and the special disruptions of millions of beings occurs. Piazza della Signoria in Florence, for example, is the blueprint, a benchmark, a symbol, a sign for a truly global and at the same time hyper-specific local site. But so is the Brandenburg Gate. Any flesh bodies and the identities they carry that are present in these sites are seemingly ripped apart by the velocity of their global circulation. Others are petrified by their lack of legitimate papers and are doomed to remain here, trapped, slowed down to zero movement. For the two instances that I just described, Schwammwesen conjures two interlinked terms, geopathology and chronostrophy. They both are not specifically defined academic terms, as Schwarmwesen does not know how to write properly beyond or out of its own ruinous bodyscape of their own deficient selfhood. Instead, it mumbles in a form of language that I, as us, call language devices. They do unfold their psycho-real power on the very side and in the moment in which they are transmitted from Schwarmwesen's artificial tongues to its followers. In the Prussian molded reconstructed symbolic center of Berlin while maneuvering across Pariser Platz, passing the fan mile and these beer bikes. These languages, these language devices remain intertwined to what they mean in Renaissance Florence on Piazza della Signoria. Language weaves those sites through time and space and it specifies their difference at the same time. Schwarmwesen paradoxically embodies both the interconnection and the difference of these sites and the bodies present. I, as Schwarmwesen, try to remain as unaware as possible of my as our reason of existence our mission, our language, my as our languagelessness, language, language 
lessness. My as our languagelessness. Meaning not the ability to speak grammatically correct. Schwammwesen does not have a semiotic lack, but a sociopolitical one. Schwammwesen lacks knowledge, context, aim. It does not have a body in this cosmology. The cosmology of capital extruding from the West since centuries, colonizing the planet, and on the verge of infecting the universe, knows no outside signs and signifiers anymore. Everything we speak might as well be technological, digital, endo-capital devices that speak us. Comparing myself as Schwabenwesen to any mono-identitist, essentialist, or individualist form of subjectivity will render us as I a deficient identity. But I as us might construct our very own beingness, our subject form, or at least to stay with this trouble of translocal hypercirculation of human bodies materially, remain in the catastrophic dysfunctioning of what Schwarmwesen calls our body time or flesh time, remain with the damages that are inflicted by endocapitalist circulation. The threat of metabolic dysfunction, if you step out of capitalist time and space regimes, these are the decentered signs and symbols of Schwarmwesen's language devices. How do they sound? How do they sound in here? Listen for yourself. In, in potentiality, potentiality this, this is, is also a petri dish, a, petri dish, a magnifying lens. A magnifying lens. An hourglass of discordant timescales. An hourglass is one of the many epicenters of a catastrophic dismembering forces. Temporal strings, Temporal strings plucked by financialized mobility and pulsed by the world market factory's rhythm, encountering those, those in lithic, in lithic limbo, limbo, preying upon heavy, heavy bodies, 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 tearing apart, tearing apart flesh and tissue into, into disjointed, disjointed particles, particles, skidding them across the planet, pulverizing any conception of a whole, an uneven and combined even and ticking, bodies out of time, bodies out of time, time interlocking and unsynced, delineating fractured time fractured, zones, a toxic imprint, I, I, as us, we I call, we call, chronostrophy, So thank you very much for bearing with me through these many forms of I as us. And now I would be interested to take you as your impressions, questions, and questions, criticisms, anything. So, thank you, Protectorama Toxica, for your visit tonight. It's very nice that you are here. Yes, now we have uh, some time again for questions from our online audience. And let's see what we have here. I have one question from our live stream. Uh, it refers to the different identities which you develop. 
What is your role? You describe it as, for example, fed by and cared for by Johannes Paul Rätscher. Is this human to take care of somebody, for example? Okay, I understand the question is about Johannes Paul Rätter, who is feeding my appearance or the continuous string of appearances that I as us construct as a lifeline. I can say as much that for those who are watching who know him, he is still here. I, as us, am many including him, and his role is hosting and contributing the flesh body to this artificial setting, skin, devices, and languages that you just heard. So he gives energy in forms of many different instances. He gives labor, he gives money, he gives food to the flesh body, he runs, he gives consciousness, he adds to us significantly. The aim, the vector, the trajectory that I as us are going on is that we become as artificial identities gradually more and more independent although we are intertwined so the more we live the more we are a life forms the longer we add languages materials sites devices and our precipitations our temples our buildings to our selves, the less we are dependent on his flesh body, the more we are distributed across all our devices, all our realizations, our platforms, the more distributed among the flesh and the device we are. But currently, he is here and he is very significant. Okay. Thank you. Then we have another question from Rosa, who is one of our participants in the Zoom. Uh, she's asking, can you please elaborate on the relationship between reproduction, productivity and fertility? And is the Earth or different ecologies already refusing or being forced to refuse normative ideas of reproduction and productivity through shifting fertilities in bodies of ground, fish, plants, mammals, etc. due to the chemical residues of the technosphere we occupy. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Let me rephrase the difference between reproduction, fertility, and? Uh, productivity. Productivity. Producti reproductivity and fertility, is that? Yeah. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an ac academic discussant, so I will not be able to draw all the references that could help us understand this in a better way than it's written in many scriptures. Um, for me, as us, as them, as Transformella, the idea of reproduction and its forces that are at play are being sort of mutated in what I call reprovolution, reprovolution. It's a revolution of the means of production within reproduction. It's a revolution of the means of reproduction, the means of species reproduction. And 
even though this is on a scale that you could call a utero factory, a very small scale with like individual artificial warmths being used to reproduce techno babies, it's for me it's the first seed of a changing of the paradigm in which production and reproduction merge and industrial production and the reproduction of the species merge. And within that field, which I call Reprovolution, a lot of mutation of the formal terms that we are used to use, such as production, fertility, reproduction, are being put into question. Mm, a longer conversation with Transformella I think would entail to look at how these moments of reproduction and production, how they touch mostly through devices, which I try to elaborate a bit on. The devices that are not only the, the medicinal, the sexological devices that perform the IVF, the surrogacy, the artificial motherhood, but also the planes that carry the cryo-freezing materials, the technology that's, uh, in, that's making possible the, the communication between sperm donor and egg cell receiver, all of these technologies intertwine to form in what we think in our psycho-real imaginative mutating of language form a completely new paradigm of how we as humans reproduce ourselves. And this is on a truly global scale, whereas at the moment, of course, it's a very miniature, a model-like um, transition from different um, from the bio reproduction that we had so far. The next question, I uh, it was too long and it would be great if you could just repeat it and so I can try to okay. answer that. That's the second part? Or? The second part, yes, please. Okay. Um, is the Earth or different ecologies already refusing normative ideas of reproduction and productivity? Can you speak up a bit, please? Uh, is the Earth or different ecologies already refusing normative ideas of reproduction and productivity through shifting fertilities due to the chemical residues of the technosphere we occupy? Mm. That is... Uh, that I would like to discuss with you if we could. <laughs> um, I hope we can do that again soon. I have very speculative ideas around that in terms of if not the earth the planet is performing an abortion on humankind but i don't think that i'm comfortable with speaking about this publicly because they are like tatters in my brain they are forms that float between identities and discourses and material making and they entail a forking, actually, in which Transformella forks as a life science or biopolitical being, forks herself into a new self, which she, as me, started last year. She forks herself into a necropolitical being, a darker one that's dealing with ashes and the, the oxidation with something that I really just have as a term, which is reptile reproduction, the alignment of human reproduction along laying eggs in a distant place, both site and time-wise, which could be by contemporary reproduction technology done. It's just socially impossible. And all of these converge to, into this rather dark and unspeakable necropolitical being that is arising from the ashes of Transformella Malor. But it's not something that I could make an argument or a thesis with. 
but I do think that if we think life on Earth as a expanded, as in a more expanded form as we in the West have thought it, then yes, I do think there is a there's a struggle for getting rid of ourselves. I have another question. Um, our participants, um, Shinnet is asking, how do I can't understand. I'm sorry. Okay. It's too far and. How do we navigate the issues of technology and reproductive equality between people around the world and issues of population growth? I'm speaking specifically about the criticisms of making kin and not babies. Mm. I guess that the whole question of repro technology is so deeply racialized and it's so deeply imbued with white supremacy that it's difficult to perform what I just proposed with extracting this technology from its determination without talking about the color line that's Im Im implemented, Im in implied by it. The, the problem there is that with liberal eugenics and with Reprotech sort of popularizing, industrializing, the languages that are employed are similar to the languages that are employed here to make neoliberalism a favorable political way. It's hoisted on the individual responsibility, on gated communities of consciousness, fortresses of being with the family, being with one another individually. The interdependence of humankind, of I as many, of us as humankind is, is largely not implied. And I think that Maya's our work is trying to make these, these connections visible again and reconnect not only with different bodies that are assigned different identities, but also with the devices and the sites and the sort of the fortresses that they are trapped in. I don't know if that's uh, so very clear now. I feel that I'm not, I cannot possibly answer it in, in the best possible way. But I have the feeling that not touching on the issue of reproduction technology um, and leaving it to repro-capitalist innovation languages is very dangerous because it's such a globally distributed industry which jumps so fast from one nation to the other with different lawmaking, different um, people involved, which we can see that this travel to the reproduction surrogacy centers in India that I as us have performed was in a time where it was an extremely liberal uh, dealing with this, whereas now as the fascist Hindu nationalist movement of Modi is in power has completely vanished. So all that I was talking about, the reproductive colonies, are vanished to another country. And nowadays they are in Ukraine or they're in other places. It's very hard to, to find the factual pinpointing of who's involved and what, uh, what is at stake. So the, the question of what are the, the racial implications of this are very important to me as us personally. They are also hard to, to like empirically or factually pinpoint. And I think what the Haraway um, criticism was also about is that it wasn't concrete enough and that it wasn't like looking at the very concrete necropolitical implications of if you say we have to become less, become um, less expansive, what does that mean for what identity? So to be concrete, to be very specific almost, 
overly specific, I think, would help in this question. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one last question, I would say. And this is coming from Eliana, is one of our participants in the Zoom. And she's asking, uh, it is somehow uncanny to see the images of Transformella and Protectorama in so many different cities now that mobility is extremely reduced due to the pandemic. At the same time, this impossibility of leaving someone's home has always been the normality for majorities in the world. In which way does the pandemic reframe and challenges I as us practices, considering that they are shaped by the enfleshed shape of a white male body and a very particular set of available resources for creation and mobility? I think that, yes, the pandemic and the polarization of the last years have dramatically changed these the, the, the emotional connection that I as us and Johannes has towards these images both in terms of how much they talk of our mind as white, as male privilege, but also on what I, as us, might have lost there. The, the part, the, the, the transformation of our identity, body identity relations, the continuous transformation of this, I think, I as us think, is a project, is a attempt to break through certain assignments and projections that are both within identity and sight that, that need, to be, need to be formulated without necessarily being transgressed. So immersing you or self into these into these into these contexts is something that I think even with the pandemic and with this the this growing um, nationalization and the closing of borders will 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 have to go on. We will have to s continue weaving, we will have to continue weaving those peoples on the planet that want a different form of cosmology that is not capitalist, that is not driven by white male identity. We need to continue weaving our desires, our abilities, our economies, our making our languages without getting without without forgetting that there is not only setbacks there's not only distortions there's not, but also that it's an unfinished project it's an unfinished task and that there is a humbleness needed to continue this even under entirely different circumstances and yes, that's what he as me and I as us will try. And I hope it can continue. Thank you. So I think now we are slowly coming to an end tonight. Um, thanks a lot to everyone who was with us tonight and of course you'll be very happy to see you again tomorrow and yeah we start again at 6 p.m online <laughs> and here um, maybe my colleagues Angela and Stefan want to add something or yes, just maybe also a big thank you for everybody watching um, and for the vivid discussion and 
I'm very much looking forward to tomorrow. Thanks a lot to Johannes and Transformella and all the others. And I'm uh, very glad to meet you tomorrow, uh, bringing in Lars Blanc as the first lecture, and then we have a common talk. And so we will see Johannes and Rosie again. And we have even two other guests tomorrow, which are kindly a surprise. And I'm lo very much looking forward to meet you tomorrow at six o'clock. And have a very nice night. A good morning, wherever you are. Thanks a lot. <laughs>